morning. For those of you that are new, my name is Josh. I'm the college and youth pastor here at the church. And this is my milk bag. <laughs> uh, so for those of you that don't know, I, I'm not able to eat. I'm not able to consume anything. Um, so a lot of you have been praying and fasting for me. And they're going on Daniel fast. I'm on a Jesus fast right now. Uh, 40 days, 40 nights, however long it takes. And so I pray I can eat again because I miss food. Um, so it's pretty probably since New Year's since I was able to eat anything. But um, um, I just want to thank you all for um, all your prayers, all your supports, um, all your visitations. Um, You've given us strength. You've supported our family. And I don't think I need to tell you what, what we're going through. You know what we're going through. Um, so I'm not going to go through much detail on that. Um, but it's been a journey. Um, I'm not supposed to be here right now. Um, I'm supposed to be in the hospital. I'm supposed to be... Um, well, so just to give you a little bit of detail, there was bleeding in my stomach. And um, they didn't know if they could stop the bleeding, and they were able to. Amen. So they were able to, yeah. They were able to go in and uh, basically put a Band-Aid on the bleeding, and they didn't know how long it would hold. Could have been a couple days, uh, no more than a month. Um, they had no idea. And Lauren was told that my life, she's like, so you're basically saying my life, his life hangs in the balance. And she said, yeah. And so basically, he needs a miracle. Amen. Amen. I said, yes. And here we are. Yeah. So it's been amazing. Um, it's been a very interesting journey. It's, it's been probably the worst and best month of our lives. It's been amazing. And so um, today, we're going to be in John chapter 9. If you open up your Bible, to so John chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. John 9, 1 through 7. I'm not going to be setting a timer. Uh, we're just going to go through it. Verse by verse, about seven verses. And see what the Lord has for us this morning. I started to get my timer ready, and I thought, you know what? We're not on a time crunch. <laughs> I'm definitely not. <laughs> so we're not on a time crunch. We're going to go through the Word, and we're just going to sit here. And whatever lunch plans you have, you're going to eat, trust me. I'm not, but you are. <laughs> and I will watch you, and I will smell all your plates, and I will be satisfied with all the, all the smells. Um, and so we're just going to spend some time in the Word, going through it slowly, worshiping Him. And in the end, we're going to have a time of prayer and healing. And if you have any healing needs, if you have any sicknesses or diseases, if you need spiritual healing, physical healing, we're going to pray for you, and you're going to be healed. You believe that? Amen. Amen. And so we're going to, at the end, we're going to spend some time in worship and prayer, and there's not going to be a time limit for that either. We'll put it on a track, put it on repeat, and we're going to spend some time in God's presence. Um... <clears throat> So thank you again for all your prayers, um, and I know I'm not the only one. As, as I talk to many of you, everybody has cancer, it seems like. Every time I talk to somebody, they got cancer. Um, it's a miracle if you don't have it, <laughs> as many people that do. But we're all dealing with a problem. We're all dealing with a setback. We're all dealing with some sort of disease. And we often, and we often ask the question, why me. And the title of today's message is simply that, Why Me? Why me? Or why him? Or why her? Why does he have to deal with this? Why does she have to have this? Why not this person? Why not someone else? Why am I being punished? Why did God give me cancer? Why did God allow this in my life? These are very common questions. What is the answer? And today, we're going to explore the answer to that question. So if you would, 
stand with me for the reading of the word of the Lord. John 9, 1 through 7 says, As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind? Jesus answered, It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, he spit on the ground, made mud with his saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So he went and washed and came back, saying, Father, we love you. Jesus, we love you and we thank you for your many, many blessings. We thank you for the healing. We thank you for the miracles that happen every day, even though we overlook them, even though we look past them. They are happening all around us. We're so unaware of the miracles that are taking place in our lives because we're experiencing them without knowledge. And so, Father, we thank you and we glorify you. And I pray that you would bless the reading of the scripture. I pray that you would bless the teaching of the word of God. I pray that you would you would consume us, Lord, and that we're, true revival would break out in this church and in this community, in the states, in the city, and all around the world, that true revival would break out because of our suffering and our repentance and our drawing back to you, Lord. Refill us with your spirit. Revive us once again. And bless the reading of your word. In your name I pray. Amen. In verse 1, he says, as I passed by, I'm going to stop right there. This is the first thing that stuck out to me. Jesus was on his way to the temple in John 8, 59. He's on his way to the temple. He has a destination. His destination is not this man that was born blind. Jesus did not walk through the town seeking out this man. He's on his way to the temple, and as he passes by, the man he is passing by and he sees the man. I wonder what this man is feeling. He's, he's hearing about Jesus, the Messiah. He's already heard two of their people being healed from blindness. And he has no idea what to expect. He doesn't see it coming. Because he's born blind. <laughs> he has no idea what to expect. And this guy, we don't know about this guy. We have no idea who he is. We don't, he's a nobody as far as we're concerned, as far as they're concerned. He's been born blind. He's not expecting it. And the thing I want you to understand, first of all, is this. The point number one. We have about five, six or seven points. Spiritual truths, we're going to walk through this. Number one, your miracle... Your healing is not a result of you seeing Jesus, but Jesus seeing you. Jesus saw this man. As he's walking by, he sees the man and stops and heals him. Jesus sees the man. The man does not see Jesus, and his miracle is not expectant on him seeing Jesus, but Jesus seeing him. And that's what I want you to know right now, that Jesus, just like Jesus saw this man born blind, he sees you too. He sees you. <clears throat> he doesn't see you because you're a Christian. He doesn't see you because you believe in God. You don't believe in God, it doesn't matter. You're an atheist, it doesn't matter. He sees you. He sees your situation. He sees your sin. He sees your cancer. He sees your depression. He sees your anxiety. He sees your loneliness. He sees that you want to kill yourself. He sees your heartbreak, your depression, your addiction. He sees you. Number two, in his, verse two, his disciples ask him, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents that he's born blind? Here's the first problem. They have bad theology. They have very bad theology. In the first century Jewish mindset, every temporal misfortune 
was God's punishment for some specific sin. You see it in the book of Job. Job is a righteous man. Nobody like him on the earth. Rich, full of life. He's got a family. He's got his possessions. Satan goes before the Lord, wants to test him. God gives him permission. And in one day, his entire family dies, except for his wife. His children is take, are taken away, his livestock, his possessions. Everything's taken away from him. God, gone. And so people ask the question, I wonder what sin Job committed. I wonder what he did to deserve this, that God would punish this man. Who sinned? The sin could have been, a, could have been committed in the womb for all these uh, disciples know. He could have sinned in the womb. Maybe that's why he's born blind. Or maybe his parents sinned. Maybe his parents sinned, victimized the child. Maybe that's why he's born blind. This does not mean that sin does not have its consequences. Of course it does, but Jesus is not saying this. The question is, why is he born blind? Why? The disciples give a false dichotomy. They only give two options, but Jesus gives a third option, and he confronts their bad theology. You think this theology exists today? This false belief causes their society to marginalize the less fortunate, those with diseases. There's the, the healed, there's the, those who have sicknesses, and those who do not. The blessed and the cursed. And yes, we do have this bad theology today. We have the health, wealth, and prosperity gospel running rampant in our nation and in our churches, saying that if you just have enough faith, God will heal you. And if he doesn't, that means probably you don't have enough faith or you have some secret sin in your life. Sorry. Let's find this sin and repent of it so you can have your miracle. You're in poverty, you have, you have money problems, maybe it's because you have sin in your life. Or maybe you don't have enough faith. It's the same bad theology that's run rampant for centuries, and it's a straight lie from hell itself. See, we don't want suffering and pain as Christians. As human beings, we don't want suffering and pain. If you're an Enneagram freak, I'm an Enneagram 7, which means, and, you, if, and you're not laughing, so you don't know what that is. An Enneagram 7, it means that I, my personality type, I'm optimistic. I do not like suffering and pain. If you know my wife, she knows that I don't like suffering and pain. I'm very sensitive. Sensitive skin. Sensitive. I don't like it. I don't like pain, and I don't like watching others suffer pain, but we don't like it. We want the blessings of God without the pain and the suffering. We want health. We, we want health. We want wealth. We want prosperity. And if we don't have it, then something must be wrong with us. We must have some secret sin, maybe not enough faith. And then people get cancer. And we don't know what to do with ourselves anymore. We fall apart, we unravel. Or something else. So where does it come from? And that's the question we keep asking. I got genetic testing. Maybe it's genetics. Maybe I inherited it. What is it? Why is it happening? Where does it come from? You're 33 years old. You're healthy. You don't get the cold. You don't get the flu. You never go to the doctor. Why are you sick? I never get sick, and all of a sudden you get cancer. Why? What happened? Is it a result of sin? A rebellion? Is it a punishment? How do we fix it? How do we rush through this process? Let's get it over with. Where's the medicine that we need to take? Where's the magic pill or silver bullet? What do we need to do to fix Josh? What do we need to fi do to fix my son or our family or our friends? What do we got to do? We don't like suffering. We don't like pain. We don't want it. And how do we respond? How do we respond? Maybe we need more faith. Maybe we need to clear all the doubters out of the room so that we don't hinder the spirit. Maybe we need more faith. How do we get more faith? Where does it come from? How do I muster it up? Can you give me more faith? How do I create it? Where do I get it? And the answer is this. You don't muster it up. How do you have such strong faith? I didn't create it. I didn't muster it up. I didn't discover it. I abided in Christ. Your faith comes from abiding in Christ. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. 
You have salvation because you heard the word of the Lord. You're, you, have, you have faith by hearing and hearing by God's word. We want faith, but we don't want to read his word. We want faith, but we, won't want, we don't want to abide in Christ. We don't have enough time. We have too many distractions. We want faith, but we don't... I'm about to jump out of my seat. We don't have enough faith. I was told to sit down and that I couldn't get up. I'm being obedient. We don't have an, uh, Sorry. You don't muster it up. It's granted to you. The more you spend time with the Lord, the more you spend time in His Word. Don't let the, Lord, the Word of the Lord depart from you. Meditate on it day and night. Then you'll have a good success. And I tell you, be strong and very courageous, for I am with you. Joshua 1.9. Ephesians 2 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and it is not of your own doing, it is the gift of God, not by real works that any man shall boast. <laughs> I'm sorry you don't have enough faith. I do. Sorry your faith is weak. I got a strong faith. No, I do not. It is granted to you by God, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of yourself, it is a gift. The grace is a gift, and the faith is a gift given to you by the Lord. It's not simply belief in something, it is trust. It's an object that is given to you by God himself. It's a supernatural work of God. You cannot find it under a rock. You cannot muster it up. You cannot create it. It is given to you by the Lord, and you get it by trusting in him. John 9, 3, Jesus answered, it was not this man's sin that, that it was not this man's sin or his parents, that were, but by the works of God might be displayed in him. It was not that this man sinned or his parents. That's not why he is born blind. It's not a punishment. But it happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Why do I have cancer? It's not a punishment. It's so that the works of God might be displayed in me. Point number two, if you want to take notes. Your problem, your suffering is not a punishment, but a platform for God to display his power. Your, punish, your problem is not a punishment. You are not being punished. You got depression, you got anxiety, you're not being punished. It is a platform for God to display his power. Why is this happening to you? So that the works of God might just be displayed in you. The reason I have cancer is irrelevant. It could be an attack from Satan. It could be a result of a fallen, broken world. The reason does not matter. What matters is the outcome. What matters is the purpose. This didn't happen because of some secret sin in my life or someone else's. It's not because I had lack of faith. It isn't a punishment. This happens so the works of God might be displayed in me and in you. Many times the suffering is a platform. For God displays power. When you see your suffering as a platform and not a punishment, you begin to see things a little bit differently. Amen. See, if I could get up, see right now, here's the thing. I'm going to give it one time. <laughs> if I come down here, you cannot see me very well. Well, you can because we, you're all eye level. But if I sit around here and I'm going through suffering and I'm going through pain, you cannot see it. If I don't talk about it, if I don't experience it with you, you cannot see it. And God cannot display his power in you if you cannot see the, the suffering, if you cannot see the problem. And so many times your problem becomes a platform for God to display his power. This is a platform. Now you can see me. Now you can see my suffering. I'm exposed. I'm in front of the public. You can see it taking place. You can see it happening. And God wants to use your suffering and your pain and your problem as a platform to elevate you so he can displace power in you so that can, people can see the glory of God all over the earth. Amen. And the reason it's not being displayed is because you don't let people see your suffering. You don't want to. You don't want to be exposed. You don't want to be vulnerable. You don't want to be authentic. You want to hide and save face 
and you want to show people that you're okay and you're strong. Let me tell you, you, can't, you can only hold it together for so long. And it's all for his glory. We must allow suffering to become our platform, but we don't want it. And here's my, been my prayer from the beginning, that for God to be most glorified, I want God to be the most glorified. Calvin, my son, a few, two years ago, two and a half years ago, was diagnosed with spina bifida. And we wanted his healing, we wanted his miracle. And the church gathered around together and prayed for us. And we were new. We barely were here. And the church gathered around for us and they prayed for us and they supported us just like they're doing now. And people so badly did not want us to go through this. They, didn't want, they wanted him to be healed. And many of us thought his spina bifida was just going to vanish when he's coming out of the room. He's just going to be healed like that. A miraculous healing. We were believing for a miracle. And you know what? He came out having surgery, having therapy, spending three weeks in the NICU, first three weeks of his life, can't take him home, visiting him night and day, needing help. Now he's going through therapy, physical therapy. And you know what? He doesn't complain one bit. If you know the kid, he has nothing but joy in his heart. Nothing but joy. He knows no other way. It would have been easy for God to heal him immediately. But how many of us would have moved on? How many of us would have forgotten? How many of, how many of us would have had to explain because you can't see his condition that, hey, actually he was born with spina bifida and God healed him like that. Cool story. But what if God is most glorified and not an instantaneous healing? What if he's more glorified in the process of healing? What if he's most glorified in the suffering? What if he's most glorified in a not vanishing and not going away and us having to go through therapy and suffering and have joy in the midst of that suffering? What if God is most glorified in that way? And I told my family, I said, it could get to the point where the doctor said, there's nothing else we can do. Let's just make Josh comfortable. And then the miracle takes place. Wouldn't it be just like God to do that? To get to the point where there's nothing else we can do. And then it ha happens. Now I'm, I'm not supposed to be here today. And here I am. Miracle after miracle after miracle. We were, we were um, supposed to have spina bifida clinic check up for Calvin. We were six months on a waiting list. And um, the way I got put in the hospital is we were there on, at Texas Children's for his appointment. I've had lots of symptoms. I was sick. I couldn't eat, couldn't sleep, couldn't go to the bathroom. And the day I went in the ER was just so happened to be the day that we had the cl clinic for Calvin. Just happened to walk over to the closest ER, just so happened to be in the hospital, that can, in the only hospital in the world that can give me the procedures that I need. Just so happened. <laughs> we have a name for all of our kids. Well, as you do too. <laughs> we, we have a meaning to the name of all of our kids. We were like, I want to name, Cal I want to name Jude, Jude, because it means man of high praise. And, and uh, Micaiah is a prophet in the Bible. Jude Micaiah. Micaiah is a prophet in the Bible, the only one that would speak on behalf of the Lord and tell the truth. And uh, we want to name Calvin Josiah, because Calvin and Josiah were both reformers. And we love the reformers. Josiah reformed the nation of Israel. And, um, and, uh, and then Luke. We didn't have a meaning for the name. And I even asked Jude, I said, Jude, what do you want to name Luke, your brother? And he said, Luke. And we never told him that. We just knew it. Just so happens, almost a year later, we have to go to St. Luke's Hospital to receive my tr treatment. 
because named after St. Luke's, the physician. And I'm not superstitious by any stretch of the imagination. I don't believe in consequences either. But that just gave us hope and peace. Many people don't want suffering, but suffering is a platform that produces character. I can't drink that, brother, sorry. No. Thank you, though. <laughs> That's for you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> suffering produces character. God is doing a work in you right at this very moment. Why suffering? Because he loves you. He loves you. Not because he hates you. You don't suffer because he hates you. You suffer because he loves you. Because he wants to change you. My prayer has been for, me to, for God to change me. God, please change me. Change me. Micah Tyler, a worship leader, wrote a song called I Want to Be Different or Different. And in the beginning of, his, of the video, his, um, he went through Harvey, lost his home, his mother had, had um, a blood disease, or his grandmother had a blood disease. Had, his brother got stage four colon cancer. And he's praying, God, would you just change these things around me? Would you just change these things around me? And then he realized, that's not the prayer I need to be praying. The prayer I need to be praying is this, God, will you change me? Don't change these circumstances, but change me so I can withstand these circumstances. And that's been my prayer for the beginning. God, would you just change me? First Peter 1, 6 through 8, in this you rejoice. But now for a little while, if necessary, you have grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. The purpose of your problem is to produce in you character and strong faith. The purpose of your problem is to produce in you character and strong faith. The purpose is refinement. He wants to refine you like gold. When your faith is tested, you should look like your creator. And see, what he's talking about, he's talking about refining gold and, or refining silver. And what a refiner would do is they would take silver and to purify it and to get rid of all the impurities, they would heat it up in a cauldron. They would heat it up in a crucible. And they would melt it down, cool it off, let the purities rise to the top, and then they would scrape off the impurities. And then melt it down again. Let the impurities rise to the surface, cool it down, scrape off the impurities from the surface. And they do it over and over and over and over and over again until all the impurities are gone, until they scrape it all off. And then all that you can see, as the refiner looks into the gold, all he can see is his reflection. And that's how you know it's purified, is when the refiner can look at what he's refining and see his own reflection and image. And that's how you know the gold is refined and purified. And the Lord is refining you. He is putting you through a crucible. He is melting you down. He's cooling you off. He's scraping off the impurities so that in the end, he can look at you and see his image in you. Amen? And what is the end result? Glorification. To look like Jesus. To reflect the image of God so that in the end, you look like Jesus glorified. Number four, there is no refinement without fire. That better not be Tom. <laughs> there is no refinement without fire. James 1, 2 through 4, Call, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect. Let it finish, that you, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Count it all joy, my brothers. See, when you see the big picture, you have joy. 
I had friends that called me and said, I didn't know what Josh me I was going to hear on the phone. Uh, my friend Derek, he was like, I, I thought I was going to call you and be like, Derek, oh, how are you? Oh, I love you. Oh. And all he hears is, hey, man, how you doing? I haven't talked to you in a while. And he said, I heard your voice, and I knew you were going to be okay. I heard the joy in your heart. I knew you were going to be okay. Count it all with joy, my brothers and sisters. For when you see the big picture, you can have joy. You can have perfect peace. When you believe and know that God is sovereign and in control of your life and your body, then you can experience true joy and perfect peace. When I got the diagnosis, we're going to go for a while, so just sit back. When we got the diagnosis, it was terrifying for Lauren. This is her worst nightmare. She's a hypochondriac, ladies and gentlemen. She thinks that every mole is cancer. Every cough is cancer. It's a running joke in our family. Everything is cancer. But her grandfather would die of a pancreatic cancer, so it is her worst nightmare. And so there's legitimacy, legitimacy to her fear. And um, when we got the diagnosis, she thought she was having a nightmare. I literally had to pinch her to wake her up, and she wasn't waking up from the nightmare. But when I heard the diagnosis, the Lord immediately spoke to me and, and said these words to me. My grace is enough for you. It's sufficient. For my power is made perfect in your weakness. And he said to me, you're going to be okay. You're safe. And immediately, he said that to me, and perfect peace cast it over me. And all I could do was smile. <laughs> they thought I was, in, I thought, they thought I was crazy. And I, and of course, so we mourned, and we cried, and we were heartbroken. And at the same time, in the midst of my suffering, there was perfect joy and peace that the Lord promises you for those who cast their cares upon him. Perfect peace. When you know it's for a purpose, then the only thing you can experience is perfect peace and joy because you know you're safe. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 through 10, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in your weakness. Therefore, I will boast all more gladly in my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So then when you're weak, it's okay. It's okay to be weak. You're not expected to be strong. It's okay to confess that things are not okay. Because you understand that this, then, you boast in your weaknesses. Because your weaknesses become a platform for God to display His glory. And what does boasting look like? You lose all your shame and your pride. You lose your insecurity. You tell the truth. I'm not strong because, but Jesus is. I'm not weak. I'm weak, but Jesus is strong. I'm content. And that's the best place to be. Trust me, when you have to be naked in, a couple, in front of a couple of nurses and they're cleaning you out, you don't have much more pride in you. <laughs> and when you're throwing up blood and you pass out from dehydration, and your wife has to call the ambulance, and your sister-in-law has to keep you awake. There's not much pride left. When you suffer, number five, when you suffer, Christ's power is at work in you. Romans 8, 28 through 30. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. good. For those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. You have been called according to what? His purpose. He has a purpose for you and a destiny. Since when? Since you became a Christian? No. 
since the beginning of time. There is always a purpose for your suffering, and it does not go wasted. It is not in vain. My charismatic family, you can jump and holler at any point. <laughs> There's always a purpose for your suffering. That should comfort you. Why? Because he's called you. He has called you out of darkness into his light. He foreknew you. He didn't just see you from a distance. He didn't learn about you. He doesn't just know you. He, does, he doesn't just know. He doesn't just read in a magical book about what's taking place in the future. God knows the future. He knows what's going to take place. He doesn't just know. He doesn't learn it. He knew you. From the beginning. He knew you. He knows you. He's on his way to the temple. He just so happens to see a man born blind. He sees you. He knows you. And this was this man's destiny from the beginning. Why is he born blind? It's for a purpose. It's been a plan from the beginning. He knows you. He sees you. So that someday Jesus would walk by, see him, and put spit and mud in his face to take his blindness and use it as a platform for God to display his glory. He predestined you. The plan for your life was decided long ago. Nothing is by chance or accident. He doesn't make it up as he goes. God doesn't make it up as he goes. He doesn't just know things. He deliberately plans them out. And it's for your good, and it's for his glory. If not, then we are in trouble. We're in a lot of trouble. Why? To be conformed to the image of his son. The end result is glory. God is in the process of glorifying you, but not without suffering, through suffering. Don't let it go wasted, folks. God wastes nothing. Your suffering is not in vain. It is a platform for God to display His glory in you. John 9, 4-7, We must work the works of Him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. Have he said these things? He spit on the ground, made mud with his saliva. Then he anointed, he anointed the man's eyes with mud and said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So he went and washed and came back and saying, you know what anointing is? It is a blessing. Oftentimes we use oil, and that's what we're going to do today. We use oil as a significance of God's spirit resting upon you and God's favor and blessing on your life. He anoints his eyes with mud. He takes the lesser part of man, dirt, and he mixes it with the best part of the Lord, saliva. You know how much saliva it takes to make mud? I'm not going to give you a demonstration. <laughs> Do you know how much saliva it takes to make mud? And he wipes it on the man's eyes, and I'm sure they're disgusted and freaking out. All the germaphobes are leaving the room. And he's, they're freaking out. And this man has no idea what's going on. I mean, can you imagine that? What this man's thinking? He's healed two other people before this. One time, he laid his hands on the guy's face, and he's healed. At the other time, he speaks the word of the Lord. He speaks out creation and recreates sight in the man's eyes. And this man cannot see what is happening. But he can probably hear what's happening. <laughs> and then everybody's freaking out. Ooh. Nobody's probably explaining to him what's happening. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> right on his face. And then he says, now go. Walk. Go to the pool of Siloam, which means scent. Wash your face off. He doesn't say he's going to be healed. He doesn't say I'm about to perform a miracle in you, and I'm going to display my power in you. He doesn't say you're going to be healed. 
He doesn't tell you what's going to happen. He just puts mud in his face and he says, walk. And what does a man do? He walks. And he goes and washes his face. And he comes back seeing. Sometimes the process is messy. And it's disgusting. Are you ready for it? What's it going to take for you to get your deliverance? What sin do you have in your life that you need to be delivered from? What confess? Who do you need to confess it to? There's still many things I have to confess. What do you need to confess so that you can get your release? What do you need to confess so you can get your forgiveness? What do you need to confess so that you can get your healing and your miracle? Not faith, confession. Obedience. If God is good, then why did he allow this to happen in the first place? You're just, you're in the right time at the right place. There's no accident that God brought you heal, here. Isn't God amazing? But God could have healed me. God could have not let me have cancer in the first place. Why do I have it? Doesn't matter. The why is not as important as the purpose. It does not freaking matter why you're going through what you're going through, why you happen to have what you have. The, perp- the point is the purpose. What are you going to do about it? How are you going to suffer? The why doesn't matter as much as the purpose. Number six, don't let the method keep you from the miracle. Don't let the method of your miracle keep you from the miracle. I've gone through a lot of suffering in this process, and I'm okay. We can talk about another time, all the side effects of chemo. I'm not even having that. The the healing may not happen the way that you want or think, but it may be the best thing for you and for his glory. The miracle comes after the obedience. The man wasn't healed until he went and washed. And how did the man respond? He obeyed. And what was his testimony? Did he give a dissertation of how salvation works? Did he write a paper? Did he go teach you a theological class? I was blind, now I see. That's all I can tell you, brothers and sisters. I was blind, now I see. In in the synagogue, in the Sanhedrin, their, their their only concern was that he was healed on the Sabbath. That's it. That was their concern. Okay, okay, but who's this man that's healing on the Sabbath? I don't know, but all I know is I was blind, now I see. No, 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 no. You did it on a Saturday. You shouldn't have done it on a Saturday. It's the Sabbath. You're breaking the Sabbath law. I don't know, but I was blind, now I see. Well, who is the man? Who is he? Who is this man that heals on the Sabbath? I don't know. All I know is I was blind, now I see. That's it. I was blind, now I see. Why me? One of my favorite pastors is Matt Chandler, from Pastor of the Village Church in Dallas. He was diagnosed with uh, an inoperable brain tumor 10 years ago this past Thanksgiving. He was preparing for his death, preparing, having conversations that he doesn't want to have with his family, having the death talk that we've also had. And he has a beautiful message to his church. And he talks about the privilege of suffering. How honored he is for God to glorify himself in this way. How thankful he is. And he has his brain tumor removed. He's going through chemo. He's healed. But he still has the process to go through. And it's Christmas morning, and he's looking at his fireplace, and he sees all these Christmas cards that everybody's sending him. And he sees a picture of this family, and he's like, I know this guy. This guy is a serial adulterer, and he emotionally abuses his kids. Why not that guy? Why me, God? Why not this guy? And immediately God spoke to him and said, you're the older brother in the story of the prodigal son. You're the older brother. 
And Matt is just crushed. And Matt realizes, just as these doctors are trying to cut this cancer out of me, God is trying to can- cut this cancer out of my heart. Isn't God wants to change you. And when you see suffering as a punishment, you ask, why me? Why not you? You deserve hell. Why not you? But when you see it as a platform for God to display his glory and his power in you, you don't ask, why me? You no longer begin to see it as a punishment, but a privilege. And then you begin to respond, thank you, God, for this opportunity and the privilege of this suffering. Thank you, God. Romans 5, 3 through 5, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. And endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. You then begin to rejoice in your suffering, because you know the purpose. To produce character, which produces hope. God is not all, God, God does not allow your suffering to be wasted or in vain. But will you? Will you allow your suffering and your pain to go wasted or in vain? See, God wants to take your suffering and your pain and use it as a platform for God to display his power in you. Deer Park First Baptist Church, family, friends, Deer Park community, people all over the country, all over the world. It's time to stop fa- uh, saving face. It's time to take the mask off. It's time to show the world that we're not okay. That we do suffer. That we do have pain. And that we are going through something. And you know what? I'm not going to hide it anymore. And I'm not going to allow the insecurity to hold me back. And I'm not going to allow fear to hold me back. I'm going to be okay. And I'm going to open up myself to others. And I'm going to suffer well. Because I don't want my, my story to go wasted. I want God to use my suffering as a platform. For God to display his power in me. Here's what your prayer needs to be. God changed me. Not God, can you change these things, but God, can you change me? And then you will be able to encourage others. God wants to put your character, your character on full display. He wants to put your character on full display. He wants to put your faith on full display so that he can put his image on full display. So that he can put his power and his glory on full display. He wants to do it through you. Are you suffering today? Are you sick? Do you need a miracle? Be obedient to his word. And then you'll have good success. Then you will prosper. And oh, my child, be strong, be courageous, for I'm with you. He tells Joshua this at least four times. Be strong and courageous. I'm with you. I allow God to put your suffering and faith on full display. Folks, he sees you. He sees you. And that's good news. Everybody stand up and close your eyes. We're going to put some music on. If you need salvation today, if you need prayer you need hope, if you need a miracle, we're going to pray for you.